Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are on a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. All right, Bruce, uh, we've bullshitted for a long time. We're on a tight schedule here. You told me I've only got an hour and 20 minutes left. Can we get started? Are you ready to do this? Ready to talk 95? Yeah, I fucking guess. I mean, it's all a blur, but let's do it. Oh, well, thanks for your enthusiasm. Yeah. Okay. Go. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson and you're listening to something to wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. Bruce, what's going on, man? How are you? I am excited to be here today, man. Holy shit. Excited to talk about 1995 because right now we are going to be in your house, bitches. For the fifth time. Five fucking psych, man. I'm ready to do this. And with your photographic memory, this is going to be a tremendous show. Of course, we're talking about. I love photographing. (laughs) <laughs> Hang on, let's get ready for this shit. I, you know, I, I Paul Bosch gave me a really beautiful uh, Nikon camera one time. Oh, I hear it right there. That must be the film developing. What's that? I said your hair looks nice. Seasons beatings is something you name this show. I guess in this era, all the shows had to be named something as a way to tell them apart. This one went down December seventeenth, nineteen ninety five. So as we're talking. Yesterday was the 25 year anniversary of the show. It's at the, you want to know what I remember about this show, Conrad, that it was in Hershey park, Pennsylvania. Yes. And you know what I did that day? You ate some chocolate. I went to the chocolate factory and the chocolate store that is connected to the Hershey park because see at this time in my life, if you will, so mm-hmm. I was, I was going to be getting married, uh, in April of the next year. All right. All right. So the Hershey Park Coliseum right next to the Hershey Park Coliseum is like the Hershey Museum. Right. And then like any good entrepreneur, you exit out that goddamn uh, Hershey Museum, you go right into the motherfucking Hershey store. Oh. They got all kinds of different chocolate. They got the Reese's Pieces. They got the Reese's Cups. They got the Hershey. They got the Hershey with almonds. They got the Hershey with the Krispies. They got all kinds of Hershey shit. And so I like got some nice like Hershey uh, Christmas shit. Oh, I thought for sure you were going to say, and then I took it back and sold it to the boys. Cause I'm an asshole. I did that too, but still, <laughs> well, no, re- I got gifts. I'm a giving motherfucker. I never asked That's what if- I do. That's what I do. I give you do. You give me fudge every month. I do. I, uh, have you had the, have you had, have you had the, uh, the tiger, the tigers, uh, tiger butter yet? I don't even know what a tiger butter is. And no. Oh, God damn. Who's fucking calling now? Oh, is that commissioner Gordon or, or Vincent Kennedy? Oh shit. That's my phone. There Don't, we go. Fix that shit. Did you just hang up on him. Yeah. Oh, well, Bruce is fired again. Boys and girls. Dude, I may be the only fucking person left in the world that has a hard line in their house. I do too. How come I never fucking knew that? Well, because I stayed there last time. You didn't have a fuck. Oh yeah. We did have a bat phone. <laughs> That's right. Well, Never mind. It's used for the intercom system. And you got to have one if you have an elevator, cause you don't want to get stuck in that motherfucker and not be able to tell nobody, you know? Yeah. Well, see, I don't have that problem. We can just go. Oh yes. Hey, yo, Amber. And then she should be here. Like at the door in a second. You have the same number of stories in your house that I have in mine. You just no, not, talk. Not, that is not true. You have two in a basement. 
You got another one up no, there. No, I have two in a basement. You, uh, no bullshit. Then you have the other wing. You have the other fucking wing. See, you're that goes shit. Up, and that counts as an extra story. Nope. And and that wing is only 10,000 square feet, so I know it's small. You're telling stories. Hey, so I told... the uh, main house. That's what, 24,000 square feet. By the way, speaking of houses, I told the, uh, the Bischoffs, who just hung out for a few days here in Huntsville, that you painted your house that it used to be brown on brown on brown on brown. And they were like, really? And I said, yeah, you painted it blue and white. And they both looked at me like I had flaming turds hung on my mouth. Like, how's that even possible? And then Eric just sort of curled his lip and said, how does it look? I said, it looks fucking great. You should see the before and after. So you got to send them some pictures because you know, they're not welcome in Stanford anymore. Ah, that's horse shit. You know what? That's fucking, that's a lie. Oh, your house isn't blue. No, they're welcome in my house anytime they want. Well, yeah, I didn't say and, that. Uh, Eric was going to come to my house, and then he ended up at your house. Oh, yeah, now no. that now you let the secret, you have let the cat out of the bag, and now I'm back to fuck Eric Bischoff. Well, that's been the feeling in that zip code for a long time. Let's talk about in your house five. I wonder if Clint from Hershey was at this show. Yes, I was there. And there were approximately 7,289 fans. That's was how many I counted. Because I like to stand at the concession stand right there where the ticket counters where they come in. And I have a clicker that tells me exactly how many people come in. And then I I do that. And then I go down and do the, do the, you know, the heavy sauce. And I multiply them times how many there were in the thing. Because then you multiply. And then you divide before you go in to the slaver and the thing with the Hershey and the chocolate. And I came up with 7,289 fans paid. By the way. I can tell. I, uh, I, I'm really proud of I'm you. I'm going to add that to my clip. <laughs> Impersonation now. Conrad. I am, I am really proud of you. What are these noises going on here tonight? That must have been your home phone again. No, it wasn't. That wasn't shit. Oh, shit, it was. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> it's so fucking loud in my headset. I'm, I'm, really, uh, I'm really proud of you for at least opening the notes today because you just nailed 7,289 fans in attendance. The estimate for the live gate was around 100 grand. But let's talk for a minute about how the show did on pay-per-view. Basically not good. Does 80,000 buys, which makes it the lowest drawing pay-per-view in WWF history. WrestleMania 11 did 325,000 buys. The very first in your house did 190. King of the ring was 150 in your house. Two was back up to 170. SummerSlam did a very respectable 205. And then in your house, three was 175. And then it, whoo plummeted for in your house for a hundred thousand buys back up for survivor series, but not a ton, only 140,000, but this one here, 80,000 for in your house five. Is this just a uh, oversaturation? Didn't have the right card. Nitro is really starting to catch fire. What's going on that makes you think this one is just the worst pay-per-view ever. I don't know. It was the worst pay-per-view ever. It's better than 75,000 buys. Well, you didn't have one of those yet. Well, still it was better at that, that time than 75,000 buys. And, and just quite frankly, not enough people wanted to tune in and watch it. I guess my question is, and I've always been fascinated by 95 and I say that every time we cover 95, but it, you know, it feels like Vince is sort of spending his tires here a little bit. Did you feel like that at the time back in 95, if you could add context to the moment? I think when you, you know, you can go back and, and history is always with 2020 vision. I think if you've actually lived in it and been a part of it, um, you know, it was still, you're, you're coming off of everything. You're coming, you're coming off of the fucking, uh, steroid case. You're coming off of, you know, this newfound competition. You, we were in uncharted waters and, it was, you're finding your way, you're, you're getting through it and things are changing and you have to, first of all, you have to figure out what's changing so that you can change with it and move along more than anything. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about what's happening the next night and boy, I feel bad going into this because I know we're going to hurt some feelings, no matter what we say, uh, Medusa is a friend of the show. 
but the night after this show, the former Alundra blaze shows up on nitro with the WWF women's title belt and throws it in the garbage can. And she called herself Medusa saying she's always been Medusa shows the belt and throws it in the trash can and says, that's what she thinks of the WWF and their women's title. And she even says WWF by name. And she says now she's in WCW. She used to be a Lundra blaze, but she wanted to come where the big boys play. And now it's where the big girls play and dumps the title in a trash can. And that's something that we talked about as being, a um, a fear for Bret Hart in 1997. Of course, we know that didn't happen, but it did happen here in 95. And, you know, Medusa is probably believe it or not best known for this moment. And she has taken credit and said, this was the first real shot in the Monday night wars. I think most would say it was the Lex Luger debut at, at nitro, but she sort of recently started to say, this is the beginning of the women's revolution. And people, some people online have been critical of that. It was a major moment on during the Monday night wars when in this era, there wasn't any major moment for the women. So it is cool in that regard, but on your side of the fence, you know, being a WWF executive at the time, was this perceived as being a, a big deal? It was de- Oh shit, man. It's definitely a blow. Fuck. Yeah. And you're, you're watching, you're seeing one of your championship belts on your competitor show and former champion dumping it in a trash can. Yeah, that was a blow. It sucked. Um, and that, that hurt. And I think that when you go back and you look at monumental moments in the history of the Monday night wars, that's one, it's going to be one of the top five. It's not number one. Uh, I think that number one is probably, more than any, I, I give it to, to Razor the first time Razor showed up, Lex showing up, and, and Hogan's turn. But when you look at all of that, this was a big move. This was a big move, and it was a slap in the face, and, and it was a kick in the balls because didn't see that one coming. Should have, but didn't. I mean, in, in hindsight... How significant is it? Do you think in the Monday night wars Meltzer would report that Vince McMahon found out about it from a technician early in the raw show and was stunned to the point that that's why he seemed so tired and distracted on the live show. And, and Meltzer was the technician that told him this because Meltzer was right there with Vince when he found out that's how he knows this information. Well, I'm asking how did te- Vince take it when he found I, I don't know. I honestly don't know. I don't t- think, I don't know that a technician told him. Uh, I have no idea and I was there. So the fact that Meltzer would have that intimate exact technician that told him again, I can't, I can't take anything that Dave Meltzer says with any credibility whatsoever because he has less than zero credibility. If that's at all possible, if you can go deep down underneath the core into where the, the, the ice cold nothingness of the world is, Dave's about 40 feet below that as far as credibility goes. So I don't, I don't know how Vince found out. I, I, have, I really How did remember. Vince take it? I think that he, he was pretty... I think he was more pissed off at himself and just the, um, the do you call it the, the process, the procedure or, or whatever the hell that wasn't done with Medusa being out of contract and not getting everything back from her. Um, th- there's so many things that could have been done better. And I think that Vince takes all of that personally and puts it on himself. So, you know, he, he doesn't matter where, where the breakdown came or what the breakdown was. Uh, I'm sure he took it very personal and, and just felt like, you know, son of a bitch, you know, we should have been better and we should have been better. Should have been better about making sure that you had your property back or should have been better. So there wasn't any regret about you know, moving away from the women's division or not doing business with WWE. I mean, with well, Medusa. you tell me, tell me how, ca- how WCW capitalized on that because I don't remember them doing shit with the women after that. I don't remember them capitalizing on Medusa at, at all after that. I mean, she was around, but no, they didn't do much. Yeah. Well, okay. Tell me how they capitalize on it. Cause, cause again, I don't think that there were, were enough 
females at the time to to really have a big division and it was something that we moved away from at the time and there wasn't there sure as hell wasn't the caliber of athlete that would come along 20 years later so yeah i mean i don't know that there was regret for that i just think it was a change in business philosophy talk to me a little bit about where the heat goes, do you guys recognize, ah, oh, this is that Eric Bischoff, fuck him. Or are you guys really upset at Medusa as well? There was a lot of that to go around, but you know, here's the thing. When you, when you look at Medusa, Medusa was doing what someone told her to do and she was going out. Medusa now is working for another company and that other company is asking her to do this and she did it. So it, it's, you, you got to give, in my opinion, you got to give the credit to, to Eric or whoever it was that made that call for her to do it. It was, it was a hell of a strike. So, you know, kudos to them for making a hell of a strike and having the balls to do it. Let's, uh, let's recap exactly what Meltzer wrote. The bombshell came on the heels of a week filled with rumors and signings. Michelli's WWF contract expired on December 13th, and it was well known within the WWF she was negotiating with WCW, and her contract wasn't renewed. So technically, she was fired. JJ Dillon sent a letter midweek to All Japan Women canceling the Blaze versus Aja Kong match that was scheduled for the Royal Rumble, which we know she said wasn't the case, uh, saying Blaze's contract was going to expire and not be renewed. This decision had to have been made several days earlier as when Kong squash match with Asari on December 11th announced well, you just skipped that first name, didn't you? Uh, Chaparita. Okay. Very good. Uh, announcers, Vince McMahon and Jerry uh, Lawler played it down and never once mentioned Alundra's name, which was a giveaway that the women's division was being abandoned. Uh, several WWF wrestlers have been under the impression that blaze was going to be dumped after the rumble anyway. We had heard several reports from Japan that Kong would be given the title in the January match. Boy, I know I'm going to get you fired up here because you really tried to downhill a few weeks ago talking about this, where you said, no, it was Bertha Fay, even though all the magazines and promos and everything for Royal Rumble said Aja Kong on it. I understand that your point was Aja Kong couldn't communicate the way Bertha Fay could. I get that but I think you were misremembering it. You want to back up on that a little bit and acknowledge that maybe you misremembered it. And Aja Kong was going to be the opponent at Royal rumble. Or she might've been the appointed opponent at Royal rumble. She may have been, but to put the championship on her and go with Aja Kong, that wasn't something that we were going to do. And it was, you know, from Aja Kong being a hell of a fucking athlete, ungoddamn believable but it wasn't going to be long-term and she wasn't going to, she wasn't going to leave Japan long-term either. So it, it was a variety of reasons that wasn't going to happen. And frankly, yeah. You know, when you look at, at Rhonda Singh and Bertha Fay, uh, she had a shitload of personality and that's, if you're going to go somewhere, that was the direction to go. Not Aja for long-term. So let's talk about this match. I want to mention to everybody. Go out of your way to watch this December 11th. It's on raw. So go click raw 1995, December 11th, watch the Sasha Kong match because she does like a, a backhand punch, I guess is what they called it in the observer. She broke the lady's nose. How about that? Well, that's a great worker. No, I'm just saying it's quite the segment. And I guess this is sort of the but end. Again, you're going to tell me that's a great worker to break someone's nose. No, I'm just saying it might be fun for our listeners to watch. You don't have to get hot about it. Well, I, I do get hot about it. Whenever I go, Oh my God, this great worker, this great worker. This I, great I, worker. I didn't say that at all. Other people have Conrad. Oh, I thought we other were talking about what me and you say. No, I'm saying that these other people that you quote as factual historians, we're talking about what a great worker it is that breaks someone's nose. You know, the, the, the idea behind the business was to make the, make it look believable, but not get hurt doing it. And then, so anyway, and the, the business has evolved. Okay. Don't get hot. Now you're hot. I'm just listening. Now you're hot. 
So let's fast forward again. We're talking about the week, um, after the Asha Kong match. So the day of Alundra dropping the uh, title in the trash can, Nitro gets a 2.7 and raw gets a 2.3. You're coming off a pay-per-view the night after a pay-per-view and Nitro wins. That's got to be disappointing, right? Yeah, it's disappointing any time that, that you're not successful in writing. So, yeah, definitely disappointing. I want to mention at the end of the syndicated superstar show that same weekend, they had Jim Ross hinting that the Ultimate Warrior might be returning to the WWF. It was never mentioned on Action Zone, which was taped later in the week, nor at this In Your House pay per view or Raw the following night. And Meltzer would say, we've been out, unable to get any confirmation on it other than the rumor mill amongst the wrestlers that Helwig would be returning as a regular starting at the Royal Rumble, but nobody seemed to know for sure. And he wasn't backstage at the show, despite all kinds of rumors going around that he was. It's possible he's coming in or given his track record that he agreed to come in early in the week and the deal had already fallen through before it was broadcast. Or it's possible that the WWF was following WCW's lead and teasing him at the last minute as a fake hot shot angle to get a last second curiosity for the pay-per-view. Of course, we know he is going to come back at WrestleMania 12. He's famously told the story of going to meet him out there. And I think Jr. was there and Linda McMahon was there and he's slinging F bombs and talking about distrucity and all of that. Would that have happened in December or would that have happened in the early part of 96? No, that happened in 96 when we actually went out there, but it was, you know, during this time that you're looking and, uh, we knew we were negotiating with warrior and looking at warrior to come back and trying to figure out what that was going to look like. And it wasn't from the standpoint of limited dates, but, but kind of looking at warrior as an attraction and not overusing him and trying to see, okay, if he's going to come back and you're going to utilize him, what's the best way to do it? And the best way in our opinion was not to not to use this guy uh every single night in the live events and maybe not every pay-per-view but use him judiciously um and it was it was unique thinking in how we had, we had thought about the business in the past because normally you sign someone it's like okay let's go to work and if they're a draw, you get them out there at every show. And this was trying to look at an Andre the Giant type attraction with Warrior and utilize him when you needed him. Let's uh, let's talk about somebody else who you did need. Stone Cold Steve Austin. Well, okay, he's not Stone Cold, and he's not even stunning. He's the ringmaster. And Meltzer would say he's backstage at the pay per view. He's going to debut at Raw the very next night. And he's given the million dollar belt and he's using the sleeper as a finisher. Meltzer writes in a funny moment, he started doing jumping jacks while wearing the belt and the belt fell off him. It's uh, it's an interesting time for his career. He did a great promo that aired just a couple of days after the pay-per-view on ECW where he says he spent four years waiting for a world title shot. And then he got it in two weeks and lost them both and admitted that he came into ECW out of shape. And he didn't rehab his arm he said if he'd smart, if he was smart, he'd call up Eric Bischoff and tell him he deserved to be an announcer of the year and kiss his ass and get his job back. So he could go back and sit around and get a big paycheck because he's disgusted with his career over the past four years, really good sort of shoot style promo that shows you what he's capable of when he's not handed a silly script and just sort of does his thing and lets his real personality shine through. But these early days of Steve Austin, long before he's stone cold, you're involved in this segment too, with the million dollar man and the belt and the sleeper. What can you tell us about it? You know, obviously he got a, he got, a, got in the game and it, and it clearly worked out, but it's hard to imagine seeing this first scene that this is going to wind up becoming what it is. Yeah. And probably the best thing that ever happened to Steve in his career. And if you were to ask him. He would probably tell you that he'd like to thank Eric Bischoff for making that decision to fire him at that time because it did get Steve off of his ass and made Steve motivated to go somewhere else and do something else. So no doubt about it, Austin always had it in him to be a top guy. If you were to ask pretty much anyone who had been in the ring with Steve Austin, 
prior to this. And anyone that had even watched Steve from afar, there was a twinkle in Steve's eye and, and you saw that there was no doubt Steve had the ability to be not just a top guy, but the top guy for whatever reason didn't happen. Um, Steve coming in now, you know, after the stuff that Steve did in ECW and his personality got out. And I think that for the underground folks that watched ECW at the time, it was like, holy shit, you know, you got to see this because Steve was just uh, freestyling, as you like to say, on Eric Bischoff in WCW. And it, it got kind of a holy shit deal. But Steve coming in as the ringmaster, it was... Uh, you know, a wrestler's gimmick is how we looked at it and looking for something a little different with Steve, but wanted to bring him in with his own championship right up top uh, with the Million Dollar Championship with DiBiase. Give him instant credibility. Get him into the mix on top right away because we knew that once Steve got there that he would deliver and that you didn't need to have the normal build, if you will, because you put him with a guy like DiBiase right off the top, and it gave him instant credibility. What did you think of his opening segment with Brother Love? I thought it was excellent. I, I thought it was fantastic. Um, you know, originally laying that thing out, Vince didn't want Steve to say anything and wanted DiBiase to do all the talking. Uh, speaking to Paul Heyman that day, Paul is the one it said, Bruce, put a microphone in his hand and, and let him talk. So Steve asked me during the day, says, hey, I've got something I'd like to say. And, you know, can I finish up and, and do this promo in the middle of the deal? I said, well, Steve, we're live. And uh, if you got a spot in there, go for it. And Steve went for it. So I thought I thought it was excellent. The whole... You know, he tapped into the brother love and put your hand on the TV and, you know, have your hand touch my hand and all that shit. And it, I think that when people talk about Steve's, Steve Austin's career, that they overlook that first promo. Because that first promo did give you glimpses of the Stone Cold character coming down the road and told you this guy can go and he's going to be a big star. Let's, uh, let's keep it going here. Let's talk about how business is. Uh, the biggest shows were December 8th in Pittsburgh. There's 5,300 fans there paying 75 grand. The next day they're in Chicago, only 3,200 paying, but it's 80 grand. And Meltzer would say, while the numbers aren't impressive on the surface, considering how loaded the shows were, when you factor in how horrible the weather was supposed to be in both cities, it's really not that bad. The other shows on the fifth and Ontario were 2,200 fans paying 38 grand Canadian, which is about the price of a happy meal here in America. And then on December 6th in Niagara falls, it was 3000 fans paying 45,000, but in Clarion PA on the seventh, there's only 1500 fans. there, pretty measly gate, just 20 grand. All of these shows had undertaker and Bret Hart on top with the undertaker getting cheered very heavily in all cities. They did change the finish up doing lots of double count outs. Some of them that went as long as 27 minutes. I guess it's worth noting, even in this era, you guys have the reputation for having the better main events when compared to WCW. Would that be fair to say? Hold on. God damn it. And we're back talking 1995 WWF, <laughs> which I know that Bruce is so excited about. Hey, look, we got good main events on top. We got Undertaker. We got Bret Hart. That's a much better main event than you're getting from any WCW house show in this era, but house show business is still struggling. Uh, do you think this is one of those, um, the business is cyclical type situations? I, I do. Uh, and I think it was, and I also would put the live events up against anybody else's live events. Um, especially at the time, I think they were damn good. And that's one thing that our audience did always have to say about us was the fact that you go to a live event and we delivered. So they were good. And sometimes, you know, business takes a dip and I think it is cyclical. Uh, Meltzer would write an army soldier was charged on December 6th with the beating of Shawn Michaels on the October 13th incident outside of that Syracuse nightclub. 
Douglas Griffin is 23 was charged with second degree assault in the beating and will face a court appearance on the 14th of December. Griffith stationed at Fort drum U S army base in Watertown, New York is being accused of beating Michael's senseless. Griffin is alleged to be one of four or five servicemen who attacked Michaels in a wild brawl that involved approximately nine servicemen and three pro wrestlers, John Michaels, Davey boy Smith, and the one, two, three kid. According to the police report, Michaels was passed out in the front seat of the car in the parking lot of a nightclub when he was pulled out of the car and had the door slammed on his head and his head slammed into the car several times before Smith was able to get out of the back seat of the car and give him a measure of protection. And finally, the bouncers from the club chased the assailants away. Initially, both Michaels and the WWF declined to press charges in the case, despite going on TV and saying the opposite, perhaps because of the fear that if the incident gained a lot of publicity, they would face embarrassing publicity that Smith was out with Michaels and the two were feuding and in fact, saved him from a worse beating. A few weeks back though, Sean changed his mind and pressed charges. I've always wondered, was there an internal discussion about, well, we should think about this because if we press charges, it's one of those chic Duggan things again, we got to think about that. Was that still applicable in 95 or not so much? I don't think so much. You know, it was a different time and it was a different place. And I think it just chalks up to during that different time and different place, having a, a change of heart and change of mind. So kind of vacillating back and forth. And that happens all the time. Let's talk for a minute about the Shawn Michaels injury angle. Since Sean is going to miss out at several important pay-per-view events or several important events, including this pay-per-view rather, they do a segment on raw with a guy billed as Sean's doctor acting as if the injuries are so severe. He may never return to wrestling. Dr. Unger is a real doctor from San Bernardino who's been around the WWF for years. So I'm pretty sure he's not Michael's personal physician, but he's a guy who likes to pal around and be friends with the wrestlers and will go on TV and help get the angle over. In other words, the entire segment was a work, a very well done work, by the way. And the next week on raw, they had a Shawn Michaels interview where he appeared to be fine and his usual self and then freaked out when Todd Pettengill brought up that his career could possibly be over. Definitely a more realistic touch. That's all from the observer. You guys would get some criticism about how you would ultimately play this out, but having a doctor go on TV, I mean, that's just good shit. Is it not? Sure it is. And so at first Meltzer says, got a guy playing a doctor. They say, oh, well, the guy playing the doctor actually is a doctor, Dr. Unger. I wonder if he actually has ever had someone that has any logic or sense. Oh God. I'm so tired of you beating on Mel. I'm so tired of the inaccuracies and his dribbling nonsense. Can we just talk about the fucking show and you just set aside your Meltzer hate? I'm commenting on his comments that you brought up for comment for me to comment. No, I thought I, I complimented you and I said, Hey, it's pretty cool when you can get a doctor on TV like this, right? That's good shit. Yes, because it was, because it was true with the injuries that he did have. There were some doctors that uh, probably would have felt that he wasn't wasn't the best idea for him to come back uh, during that time frame, but he was medically cleared to come back. I want to mention replays. Um, there's a Nitro replay that everybody's familiar with, and you guys at least tried a Thursday Raw replay. And Meltzer would say the Thursday Raw replay has been canceled. It was a catch twenty two anyway. The WWF never plugged the show for fear. It might hurt the Monday numbers, uh, for a slight bit for people who would watch nitro and then watch the replay three nights later with no plugs. The ratings weren't competitive with what USA wants in prime time. So now it's gone. Did they come to you guys and say, Hey, we really want to try this. And you sort of felt like you had to acquiesce, even though you really didn't want to. Well, you know, it, it was again, when you have a partner and you're working with the network you try to you want them to be a part of it just as as much as as you possibly can and if they're supporting something so yeah it's an experiment and it's an opportunity to possibly garner more audience and possibly a different audience so why not try it it's just yeah it's it's something that both both sides talked about and looked into and from network's point of view 
hey, if we can get another run in a show, then great. Let's talk about the end of Survivor Series. We, we just talked about this show not that long ago, but it makes the newsletter here that you guys were fielding complaints from people because Brett and Diesel had used chairs at Survivor Series, which is silly. I can't believe anybody would give a shit. But then that Diesel mouthed the word motherfucker at Survivor Series. Um, and Meltzer would say they're trying to do a balancing act between making it a rougher product, but not alienating any of their audience or sponsors. And this isn't going to be easy. No doubt about that. It's going to be an issue for a long time where you're trying to make sure that you have an entertaining show, but you don't want to alienate anybody, but it is a pay-per-view like what the fuck it is. And it was a late night pay-per-view. And I think that regardless, there are going to be those that will arg always argue the family aspect of it. Um, look, you're trying some things and, and I, I'm sure that the first time that uh, Dennis Fran showed his ass on network television, that that was a huge outcry of holy shit. You know, they're showing someone's ass on primetime network television. It's you take steps, motherfucker, probably too far. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but again, you have to take, you have to take steps and see where those boundaries are and where people's comfort zone is. Now you can you can see, you know, hell, you could you used to not be able to even say hell. You know, there was a time uh, in my lifetime where people couldn't sit, couldn't be in the same bed. A male and a female couldn't be in the same bed, even if they were married on TV, without one foot touching the ground. Mm. When you you know you go back and look at standards and practices and and things, so. You know, you grow, you try to do things differently. Might have pushed the envelope a little bit too much, but we had we had pushed the envelope the other way so much, too, trying to, to be a little bit more sanitary that when you go back to it, people automatically jump on it and go, oh, look at what they're doing. So you, you walk that line and you try to balance as best you possibly can. Let's, uh, let's talk about something else that's making the news here that I can't believe we've never really talked about. Uh, McMahon was at the wedding of Richard Glover, an ESPN executive who was a former Titan VP and talked about Bruce Pritchard being the key force in booking that brother love would be getting a huge push and they're going to introduce a hot looking girl as sister love. And there was some speculation that it might be ECW's Beulah McGillicuddy. Um, said that this is the rumor because it's hinted at that this person has posed for penthouse. And of course, in real life, the person who played Beulah McGillicuddy was indeed in penthouse. Let's talk about sister love. What do you remember about this? I was an idea that was floated around at one point and you know, um, I thought wasn't crazy about it from the standpoint of trying to be a talent and do both. Um, but it was floated out there. Yeah, it definitely was. And to have a really beautiful sidekick that would be sister love that you kind of wonder about the relationship between brother and sister, if you will, and how much love and how much they truly do love each other. Um, it was thrown out there and then, uh, it was quickly thrown out of there. Well, why, why don't you think it was a hit? Why did we not go forward with it? I, you know, I, I don't think that came up with the right story. I think we could have come up with the right story. I just thought that there were better ways to tell the story than, than with brother love. And, and it was, it was two non-working individuals, now, right? Yeah. Two non-working individuals that would have taken up, you know, a lot of that time. Is, is this just freestyling the whole penthouse pet thing or was Beulah seriously considered? I don't know if she was a penthouse pet. I, does it say that she was going to be a, get a feature in penthouse if she did the brother love thing? No, she had already done it. I mean, I, okay. hey, fuck all the penthouse pet stuff. Did you have someone in mind? I feel like I'm doing a podcast with Eric I Bischoff. Feel, I, I think that Beulah was somebody that we did consider. Why don't you think if you considered her for this i mean did you consider for other stuff in the future and the timing wasn't right or her situation wasn't right or 
I don't know. You know, I, I look, and, and I was going through Paul Lee, so who oh, knows? Okay, got it. Beulah is not interested. <laughs> Let's talk about the show itself. Bruce, you watched this for the first time in 25 years this week. Uh, it got 48% uh, thumbs up, 48% thumbs down, 3.3% uh, thumbs in the middle. So. Now, basic, now, based on those numbers, wouldn't they all basically be thumbs in the middle? If you got 48 up, 48 down, then kind of aren't they just like in the middle pointing at each other? They're docking. I don't know what that means. Don't Google it. Uh, would you give this a thumbs up or a thumbs down? I would give it a solid. Solid? Solid show, dog. Solid. You know. Solid dog. The uh, solid doc. The dark match is Savio Vega beating Bob Backlund. Meltzer described it as dreadful. Gave it half a star. I guess it's not really an in-your-house match if it doesn't open with a Savio Vega match. The first match on the show itself: Razor Ramon and Marty Jannetty beating the One Two Three Kid and Sid. What an odd team that is! One Two Three Kid and Sid. Uh, it happens when Ramon pins Sid after a bulldog off the middle rope. Goldust is going to watch the match at ringside and talk about how masculine Ramon is and then give Todd Pettengill a note, which turned into a love letter. Uh, Meltzer would say this match was a disappointment as Janetti's work has been slow and sluggish since returning and Sid was pretty bad. The match just never got going. Although there was good heat for Ramon versus kid. He gave it a star and a quarter lot to unpack here. Let's talk about. Sid and the kid. I mean, that could have been a fun team name. And I guess they sort of offset each other pretty nicely. You've got a lot of acrobats and a lot of, uh, martial arts and fancy high flying moves. And then you got big brooding choke slams. <laughs> yeah. The only thing was you didn't see a whole lot of that fly high fly and just goddamn whiz irking all over the place there. Um, Sid and kid, you know, Sid and the kid, that would have been the name. If we'd only thought of that, then is, is the tag team, then fuck, it would have been tag team champions and would have had a whole completely different world around us. As we sit here today, big Sid Udi is that Gilbert you say, Ooh, it's Sid Udi. Um, you know, it was decent, but it wasn't anything to write home about and go, Holy shit. Did you see that match? It was okay. And especially when you consider the talent involved in it, uh, at least with Razor, Marty, and Kid, and then just Sid from sheer star power and being a monster. But it was, for my purposes, I thought it was just okay. Nothing great. Let's talk about uh, the whole Razor thing. We've talked about this before in our razor episode. And I think in our gold dust episode, this was like the original plan of where we were heading with gold dust and razor. And I think we wanted to probably stretch this out a little longer. How far in were you with this before razor said, Hey man, not comfortable. Well, at this point, you know, we were still in the, in the early, in the early makings of it. And I don't, you know, I, I never got, if. Razor had an issue with Dustin or just the gold dust character or the way that the personal issue was going to work out. Um, but Razor just didn't, you know, I don't think Razor was ever really into it, but he was in the beginning. Okay. You know, man, I'm willing to try and, and, and we'll, we'll see where this goes and shit. But I never felt that he really had his heart into it, never embraced it to the point of, yeah, man, I'm gonna go out and get this guy over. And we're gonna have a hell of we're gonna have a hell of a hot personal issue and do some crazy shit. I don't think Razor was ever at that point at all. Let's talk a little bit about uh Marty Gennetti. Meltzer, <laughs> Meltzer points out you forgot to turn your mic off and just coughed I right tried. into it. And when I coughed, I looked over and it wasn't blinking. It's kind I of did try. I push, I mash the button, and it's a button. It's a button on top there that was hitting, well, and then I was coughing. I wasn't even there. Uh, Marty Janetti looking a little sluggish. 
it didn't and I didn't do the thing and I had the in my throat. <laughs> oh, okay. Let's move on. Now I'm just gonna fucking cough. I ain't even gonna fucking try no more. Can we talk about Marty Gennetti? Is that possible? Sure. Was he, he it's written in the observer here, he's slowing down. Is he just partying too much? Has he got some injuries going on? You know, we've talked about the hokey pokey that is Marty Gennetti a lot here on the show. And I don't know. Chat me up on where you were with him in 95. You know, I think that at this point, I think Marty saw Sean's career going in one direction and his career going in the other direction. So it was, I don't think it was a a matter of Marty slowing down more than it was uh, an attitude of Marty that, ah, fuck, you know, Sean's going to do his thing. And Marty almost accepting or relegating himself to the role of, oh, I'm the other guy. I'm, I'm Marty Janetti, which has become kind of like a Munson in Kingpin. You know, oh, he was the Marty Janetti of the team. And I, that always dumbfounded me because Marty was a fucking excellent worker. And, you know, an incredible part of the Rockers team. Yes, Sean went on. I guess it's because Sean went on to a lot of fame and fortune and Marty didn't. But I always thought Marty was incredibly talented and, and a great fucking talent. Here, I think it was more his attitude than anything that was kind of showing in his ring work. Let's uh, let's talk about the next moment in the show here, because this is quite a moment. Most would say at this point, to show a communication breakdown somewhere, Ring announcer Manny Garcia announced that coming from Knoxville, Tennessee, nature boy, Buddy Rydell. So one would assume that Landell was getting a new name and about to debut, but then Jerry Lawler cuts him off and goes to the ring for a surprise, which would surely be Landell, but instead it was Jeff Jarrett. Lawler gave Jarrett a plaque commemorating a gold CD and Jarrett announced he'd be in the rumble. Meltzer would say Jarrett got no pop at all. When the segment was over, there were light cheers and light boos, but no real reaction. Many have now forgotten just how great the video and the Michaels was Michaels. Easy for me to say the Michaels match was until the very end of his first WWF tenure. Jarrett was actually the least over wrestler in the company of all the guys who got a push. He did a good job, but the segment didn't get much of a reaction in hindsight. He killed all his momentum when he went home after that second in your house. Did he know it? In my opinion, yes. I think that Jeff was never hotter than at the peak with Shawn Michaels and the whole uh, lip syncing controversy and what have you. And we will never know what would have happened on the other side. But I do think that that was the one pivotal moment where I think that Jeff would have gotten over to being that nasty shit heel and have people actually care about him. Never got to see it. What, what do you think happened with this communication gaffe and the announcer here? Man, he fucked up. I actually I very vividly remember this because man, he fucked up and it was like, God damn it. So you got Jerry that was going to interrupt it anyway. And let Jerry bust his ass for fucking it up. But now that I think about it, I like that old buddy Rydell, you know, buddy Rydell. Could like change business on nature boy, buddy Rydell. Well, he's here. Ahmed Johnson is going to beat buddy Landell in 42 seconds. Don't know what took him so long with the tiger driver, which is now called the Pearl river plunge. Dean Douglas came out and said he was scratched from the show by the doctor with a bad back, but he's bringing in Landell as his replacement. Landell came out to Ric Flair's old WWF music. And Landell jumps Johnson, who didn't sell anything. And after the match, Johnson spaked Douglas with a paddle. Boy, Vince McMahon is in love with some Ahmed Johnson here, is he not? Yeah, there were big, you know, there were big plans for Ahmed Johnson. And with him coming in, Ahmed had an unfucking canny animal charisma. I mean, that some bitch just fucking oozed charisma when he came out and looked like he would kill you. So very athletic, could do some shit, did not know his own strength, was not the greatest worker in the world by any stretch of the imagination. However, he was exciting and he was unpredictable. So those were things that you could harness. We were hopefully going to be able to mold some of the unpredictability about him, at least in the ring. 
Um, Ahmed had the look. Ahmed was one of those guys that was on a short list of, I could see him as WWE champion. And no, he was never promised that. Um, but he was one of those guys that internally we looked at and down the line, could you get to Ahmed as WWE champion? Yes. Who Not else was that? Who else was advocating for Ahmed besides Vince? I know Bill Watts was a fan. Feels like Jim Ross would have been a fan. Yeah. I think, I think everybody was Michael Hayes. Good Lord. Oh my God. Uh, big fan of Ahmed. He thought this is his new JYD. Yeah. Michael, I mean, Michael was a big fan. Michael had worked with Ahmed in Dallas. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, Michael had worked with the very, uh, green and raw Ahmed and saw a lot of potential in him as well. And Michael was singing his praises as he came in. Talk to me about buddy Landale. I got to admit, I kind of didn't even remember he was ever here. And then I saw this pay-per-view back and I'm thinking, well, that went about like I planned or hoped, or maybe that's why I don't remember. My goodness. 42 now seconds. You can say you've seen it. <laughs> Buddy Landell was always known as a very capable performer, but perhaps behind the scenes just had some substance stuff going on. He did some great promos here in 95. Uh, he was promoting a match with Shawn Michaels, not in the WWF, but as a favor in the territories and smoky mountain and. I love that promo and I love the story, but by 95, it just feels like maybe you guys aren't willing to roll the dice on him. You know, I knew buddy from buddy's like first few months in the wrestling business when he came in and we were, uh, in mid South. Hold on. God damn it. Okay, we're back and we're talking about Buddy Landell, and you're so excited, and it's a great day. Oh goddamn, yeah, hey, motherfucker! <laughs> but Buddy, Buddy had come into Mid South, man. He was he was fucking Buddy Landell. He had brown hair and shit and everything. Nice fucking, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not calm, humble, very humble kid, and. You know, just guy. Hey, buddy, how you doing, man? You know, the next time I I see Buddy, he's got the bleach blonde hair and all this shit, and he's uh, the Nature Boy, Buddy Landell, and he's a flare fucking ripoff. And I think that any time, look, I don't know anybody, with the exception of Ric Flair, probably <laughs> that ripped off, you know, another gimmick that way, a blatant ripoff of a gimmick. You know, Ric Flair ripped off Nature Boy, Buddy Rogers, and to the modern era, Ric Flair is the, the original nature boy. So anybody that takes it from there, they're ripping off Ric Flair. And that's what Buddy was doing. And it was a poor man's version of Ric Flair. It's kind of like when Tatanka got into the Million Dollar Corporation and, and he talked about it. He goes, yeah, I've got my suits from Montgomery Ward. I got my shoes from Floor Shine. And it was like, he's going through all this shit. We, and we gave him like all the stuff and I came back and said, seriously, dude, your shoes are from floor shine. Cause fuck man, these were expensive. They were like $49. Yeah, I get that. But it's like you could have gone Gucci. You could have gone Ferragamo. You could have gone any place else other than the fucking shoe store. That's in the mall that has the $49 specials. <laughs> So anyway, Buddy Landell was just a fucking ripoff of, of Rick. And I don't know that, that anybody ever took Buddy seriously because he was a parody. And Buddy could talk. But I remember Buddy's first main event was in Houston, Texas, against Super Sock Jose Lothario. And Buddy is cutting promos. And, and the boys, good goddamn, man. Buddy was bragging about how, hey, baby, that's right. I'm I'm main event. I'm main event, baby. That's right. Sam Houston Coliseum Friday night, baby. I'm main event. And he'd, he'd just like tore everybody up for all week long. That Buddy, I'm main event, baby. I'm main event. And I think it was one of the, uh, at the time, I think it was the worst house that year. And it may have been the worst house all year. Um with Buddy on top with Jose and and I'll never forget that's where Buddy came up with the, you know, hey, let me tell you something, Jose Lothario, you taco Tito. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I said it. I said it. That's right. 
And so everybody started mimicking them. Anytime you just say something stupid, you'd follow it up with, that's right, I said it. Oh, we got to do that more often here on the show. And, well, yeah, I just said it, didn't I? That's right, you said it. That's right, I said it, bitch. So <laughs> that was Buddy Landell. So now, fast forward here to, to 1995. And Buddy, uh, you know, Cornette was, was working with us and stuff and, you know, rock and roll, come in, done a couple shots and different shit. And old nature boy, buddy Landell thought, well, fuck man, is there something we could get out of, out of the nature boy? But it was shortly after this, that, that, uh, buddy had the slip and fall, I think in Philadelphia and his career was over. And he, I think he sued the hotel and somebody else and all this other shit. But, um, had a lot of talent. I just think sometimes that talent was misplaced. If you would have been any other gimmick, do you think it would have turned out any better or different? You know, buddy was the guy that he was the friend that popped off with the big guy behind him mm. that got in all the fights, but had the big guy fight his fights over his mouth. With the right sidekick, Buddy Landell was money. Are you saying he did that in real life or that would have been a great chicken shit heel gimmick for him? Would have been a great chicken shit heel gimmick if Buddy really would have embraced it. And Buddy did with Butch Reed. Mm. And and it kind of was that way in real life. A little bit with him and Butch because it, it was like uh, he would he would he would pop off to people because he knew he had Butch's backup and people would take one look at buddy and go like, yeah, I'm fucking kidding. And then they look over at Butch and Butch would just kind of glare at him and nobody wants to fuck with Butch Reed. No, I give shit who you are. Well, the Steiner brothers, maybe. Yeah. They didn't fuck with Ron. And why is that? Ron's a badass motherfucker. He's unfuck with <laughs> what unfuck with He is unfuck with Okay. So let's talk about this, uh, this commentary, Vince Lawler and Jeff Jarrett are arguing with Jarrett saying he don't wrestle fair. And Vince says, Lawler is afraid to interview Ahmed. So then of course he goes and interviews Johnson and he begins by saying he wants to have a word with the teacher's pest and double J and he both say they aren't impressed. Lawler says Jarrett lettered in football. And when Ahmed lettered, he had to get the coach to read it to him. And Ahmed's interview is a real treasure. You got to go out of your way to see it. This might be the only time he doesn't start a promo by saying, first of all, he calls Jared an achy, breaky heart wannabe. That actually gets a pop unbelievably. He calls him a fake urban cowboy. He looks at Lawler and looks legitimately hot and stumbles through. Let me tell you something. You have one more time to ever get in my face again. Talking about you understand that you understand. I'm going to make your boy. I'm going to make you something you never, ever thought. People are with it. And then somehow it works. Jarrett breaks the framed album over the back of Johnson's head. He swings again with the glass to break it. And then Jarrett says, King, get him a chair. Lawler holds up a chair as Ahmed is rammed into it face first. Jarrett swings once again on the back, pretty standard, but he hits Ahmed in the face with the seat of the chair and Vince screams. Oh no. Um, it's pretty confusing here. And a couple of these are some pretty stiff looking chair shots. What do you remember about this mess of a segment? Well, it was a mess, but like you said, at the same time, people were in Ahmed. Yeah, they were. They were in Ahmed. They believed in him because they believed his shit looked real because a lot of it was real. And, <laughs> you know, say, say what you will about Jeff. Jeff. Jeff would bring a chair. Jeff would bring it when it was time and could hang in there with just about anybody. So, I actually enjoyed it. Thought it was good. It was one of those kind of, you know, vicious, nice, solid, holy fuck moments and a little different than, than what they had seen. And Ahmed was a big, believable son of a bitch. The next match begins with us zooming out on the prolapsed asshole of a pig. It's the hog pen, which is in the middle of the audience. A lot of fans are seated next to a bunch of nasty hogs. Make your own jokes here. Uh, lots to unpack here on this. Whose fucking idea was the hog pen match on a fuck you. That's a great, you got a goddamn hog farmer. Okay. So it was your idea. Got it. 
you had a hog farmer, and you had a guy from Greenwich, Connecticut, which they ain't never had no, I bet you they ain't even got no hog on their table at Christmas. Well, mama cooked the breakfast with no hog, as you know. I, I know, but I'm just saying that it was, you know, the, the, the two extremes from the opposite ends kind of meeting in the middle in the farmer's hog pen. You going to chat me up here about this idea? I, I thought it was a great idea. It was, again, you know, you, you had through the years, you go back in the pictorial guide to wrestling. Uh, I believe it was 1967 that the book was released. And you look at some of the, the unique matches that had taken place over time. And, and I remember Paul Bosch in Houston would, would always have some unique matches. There was a bathtub match where they took a big bathtub and put a bathtub in the middle of the ring. From there, they had the loser has to wash a jackass with Tony Bourne's dad um, and, and Danny McShane and, and loser uh, Irish Danny McShane on uh, St. Patrick's Day. The loser of the match gets painted green and they had the buckets of paint and had to paint the loser green. You had matches held in snow pitch. You had matches held in mud. What, you know trying to combine a lot of that is why not have build an actual hog pen with hogs in it and have the match there where else? I mean, uh, different guys have their, their matches. You know, you have a hell in a cell match. You, you have a, <laughs> you know, maybe a dog collar chain match. Well, this goddamn hog pen match where Henry Godwin is at home. It's hilarious. It's hilarious to me that. You just legitimately tried to compare a hog pen match to a hell in a cell. Hey, same concept. You're locked inside of a fucking pen. <laughs> Can't get out. <laughs> You're in there with a bunch of fucking hungry hogs. You can't. Hungry, hungry hogs. You can't get out. You can't get out, man. When you're in a hog pen and you're in like about three feet of mud, where are you going to go? Here's the thing. When you say can't get out, this is, at, can't get out. this it's is locked. at best a four foot structure that you could just step right over. No, it was at least five feet. Well, then Hunter seven feet tall, which you yeah. knew, I guess you've known that for years. Yeah. Um, now listen, I don't know the full story, but I know there has got to be a story about these hogs and Owen Hart and Vince McMahon. No, I wasn't involved, but you know, you go back and I, Jesus Christ, that gash on the back of Hunter's back was absolutely ugly. And you saw that scar for years, probably still very prevalent, but early in the match, Hunter got busted open on the damn, uh, pin in the match. And then he's taking these bumps and all this dirt and, and poop and just, Everything else, we're like, oh, God damn, we got to get that cleaned out bad as soon as he gets back here. Um, but at the end of the night, you know, you got your you got your pigs out there, and they, they was working pigs. Wait, wait, whoa, whoa. Huh? What is a working pig? They're working pigs. They, they work with you and shit. They did spots and everything. They work down there at the fucking flea market. But what's your favorite hog spot? Ah, the, the one with the tail. Hmm. A little curly cue and shit, and then they go, wee, wee. Who was the best worker of the, of the hogs here? Oh, uh, Piggly. So the Wiggly family. <laughs> what? Bruce, can you tell us the story about Vince McMahon and the goddamn <laughs> so, hog? End of the night. And we're in Hershey, and they had, they had the side entrance and all that stuff, which kind of went out and went out, uh, to a like a driveway area and all that shit there. So we had the, the truck backed up there where the hog farmer was going to take all of his hogs at the end of the thing, right? So you have to build a track for the pigs. And you have to basically put fences along the line so that when you go in and it's like, you know, come on, biggie, shoot it! You know, come on, come on! And you go and you get the pigs, and when one starts running, the other ones kind of run behind them. And they they run out, and you have a narrow little path for them to uh to go in. 
Sorry. All right, and we're back. And God damn, we're having so much fun talking about 95. It's such a great day to be alive. And uh, you were telling us about how the hog pen has been constructed. There's like a little narrow piece to get them all through, right? Yeah, but see, so you got to get them back into the truck. The truck pulls up. Now, you, you've got to build like a, a ramp or a, like a tunnel for the for the pigs to go. And and when you get in, you ha, so wait, so wait, and you get them going. Um, when one pig goes, the rest of them kind of follow. So we had a tunnel built and it kind of went, you know, through the, through the seats and shit. And it went through the vomitorium there and it went right past Vince's office down the hallway and right into the, to the pig, uh, truck. So the pigs just go, man, you, you got to make it. The, the tunnel is only wide enough for one pig and they pretty much stay and they, they run. You got a guy coming along behind them and you got them along the way, kind of shooing them along and shit. So as we're sitting there, we go, Steve Taylor and I are looking, and there's Vince's office. And Vince finished up the show, and there was like another little little room where he was in the back of and all the shit. So we just kind of took one like wall of the tunnel and put it at a 90 degree angle, and then we took like the rest of the walls on the other side turned them at a 90 degree angle so that the only place that these pigs had to go was right into Vince's office. So while Vince is in like the bathroom area and all this shit getting changed and, and what have you for the night and we're getting ready to leave and here come all the pigs fresh out of their pig shit and mud and all their crap. And we just kind of directed them right into Vince's office and then shut the door. And well, he wasn't real happy. <laughs> he being the hogs, the male hogs, huh? he being the male hog. Yeah. He, he wasn't real fucking happy. And, uh, I know that Pat's name was thrown out there. I don't even think Pat was fucking there. Um, he might've been, he might've been, that might've been one of Pat's last shows in this, in this era. But, um, we were kind of laughing our ass off. And the, the problem now is, is because we moved, the the little tunnel shit. Well, now you got to build the tunnel back so that they, when they come out of Vince's office, that they don't go back to the fucking pen in the arena. So we had everybody kind of pissed off at us from, from Vince was pissed off because he had a bunch of stinky, uh, shitty buddy hogs in his office to the, the guy that was in charge of the pigs because now he's got to rebuild the thing and fucking turn it all back. So they don't go back to the goddamn pig pen in the ring and yeah, we had a few people kind of pissed off at us, but that's the story of my life, Connie. So what since I, this was, you know, akin to the hell in a cell, why was this? Like, yes. I guess my question is the hell in a cell has become a staple pay-per-view. Why is there not a hog pen pay-per-view here in 2020? Can we make that happen in 2021? You never say never in the world wrestling federation anywhere. Uh, Hunter Hearst Helmsley beat Henry Godwin in the Arkansas hog pen match at eight 58 hillbilly Jim looking much older. Arkansas. Yeah. My daughter's name is Kansas. So I always pronounce it that way as a tribute to her. Sort of like you'll sometimes say, oh man, he was hurt. He had to call the Amber lamps. Oh, he told Wisconsin. I said, hello. Uh, looking much older than the last time he was on WWF TV. He came out as a special surprise referee and got a good reaction. Uh, he could never work, but he had a lot of charisma. Both of these guys worked hard, but the idea was to work the match down behind the ringside area and throw the opponent into the hog pen for the win. It made everything in the ring lack any meaning. Godwin heaved the slot bucket at Helmsley who got out of the way and a ringside attendant, maybe Mark Eaton took the brunt of it by blocking it from the fans. Helmsley then had some of the slot rubbed in his face. They worked their way to the pen and Godwin whipped Helmsley into the pen and tried to backflip him in, but Helmsley landed on top. Helmsley then delivered a cactus Jack elbow off the pen onto the floor, which was also covered with mats. They worked their way back to the ring then back out again. The finish would see Godwin deliver his slot drop near the pen and then have Helmsley set up he goes for the tackle, but Helmsley ducks and Godwin goes into the pen and loses. Helmsley then gets in a shoving contest with Hillbilly Jim, but Godwin came back and press slammed Helmsley, dropping him face first into the pen. 
then body slams him into the pen. It was even more gross since Helmsley had a cut opened up on his back from a guardrail shot. Helmsley then slipped around doing a Bobby Heenan inside the pen, falling down time after time. One star boy did. I mean, this is boy, uh, you, that fucking you put, I'm telling you right now. Oh, don't you make a Tokyo Dome you joke. Put that motherfucker God in the Tokyo damn. Dome. 42 stars. And don't go mess with the country boy. Country boy. Country boy. Don't go mess with the country boy. Don't mess with the country boy. By the way, there's going to be some people who would say they would never do a match like this in Japan. But I mean. That's fucking horseshit. Yeah. Horseshit. No, it's hog shit, Bruce. Yeah, well, they uh, trust me, they do it in Japan. Listen, uh, this feels like punishment for Hunter, but this is pre curtain call. Uh, what the fuck? Why, is, I- why is being in a feature match, <laughs> a specialty feature match? Well, this, uh, hang on now. Well, that, uh, punish me every day of the week, then. The, the next thing you're going to tell me is that you're going to have dog food rubbed on Roman Reigns. Now, would you have ever done that? Oh, wait, hang on. During the match, Jerry Lawler keeps telling the. I'll tell you something. Back in the day, JYD and Gino Hernandez <laughs> in a dog food match fucking sold out everywhere. Fucking to see Gino get that dog food shoved in his fucking mouth. Yeah, back in the day, we had three channels, too. Actually, well, maybe in Hillbilly Country, we had five in Texas. Well, two of them were Spanish. See? During the match, Lawler keeps telling these Foxworthy redneck jokes, but he's changing it from, you might be from bitters, Arkansas. After several, several of these Vince shouts, I'm not from bitters, Arkansas. What is this stuff? Do you think Vince had any clue what a Jeff Foxworthy, you might be a redneck joke was? There's no way he knew that, right? No, he knew it. Really? Just Lawler was a terrible joke teller. Oh my God. Listen to you. Just saying. So Hillbilly Jim here. I guess if you're gonna have a hog pen match, he's gotta go with it, right? It's like peas and carrots. Damn right, don't go mess with country boy, country boy, country boy. Don't go mess with country boy, don't mess with country boy. Spend my knees working hard on the go with the hands on the clock. Keep spinning to hey, you know, you know I can't wait to be alone with my baby tonight. Hey, ha, what? it's like a medley. What's wrong with you? You realize you're going to get another call in a minute. And we're going to have to stop and you're wasting valuable time singing songs. Nobody wants to hear. Okay. Let's get to the main event. Well, hang on. Out of curiosity, there is no bitters, Arkansas. There's a biggers. There's a bald knob. There's a wiener, but no, no bitters. You ever been to wiener, Arkansas? I've been through wiener, Arkansas. Well, that's how you get your big push. Uh, Owen, go. Owen Hart beat diesel by DQ in 434 when diesel shoves the ref after using the jackknife after the match, he used another jackknife. Uh, Meltzer would say Hart did a great job of carrying this star and a half. I like this continuing to build diesel with the attitude. You know, he's not happy with the way everything ended at survivor series. And now, you know, it's our follow-up pay-per-view in December. We're so, we're showing him with a, a hard edge. I think the next month he's actually going to start flipping people off. Kind of a big deal here. Did you like this progression of the diesel character? I did. Uh, it was, it was more, <laughs> it was more to the true character. So it was coming to life and it was something that Kevin was comfortable in. And I think that resonated. People could believe in it. Next up Meltzer writes, Ted DiBiase did an interview saying he could buy anyone. At about that same time, Savio Vega, who would work the dark match, was throwing WWF merchandise to the crowd along with Santa Claus. DiBiase told Savio he could even buy him. The two started arguing when Santa jumped Vega and attacked him. You could see this coming a mile away, but for some reason, I always enjoy these Santa Claus angles. I guess because one of the best angles I ever saw was a Santa Claus angle in 83 at the Reunion Arena in Dallas during the Von Erichs Freebirds feud where Doc Hendricks in his former life dressed up as Santa Claus and then turned on the Von Erics. Bill Mercer questioned whether or not that was the real Santa Claus. Uh, DiBiase left with Santa and then Vega ran from the ring and attacked him, pulling off his hat, wig, and beard, revealing him to be John Rickner. And the next night they gave him his new ring name, 
Santa Claus. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, this is the debut of Santa Claus. We all know him as balls Mahoney and he appears on the brother love show the next night. Apparently Santa had an evil twin and his name was Santa only instead of North pole. He is from the South pole and he pins Brian Walsh the next night at TV. And of course the gimmick was killed that same week. And on a you shoot with Sean Oliver, friend of the show balls said that Vince wanted him to stay on the roster and pay him until another opportunity came up. But apparently a leak to the dirt sheet said he stayed until he got drunk in the locker room. Uh, Mahoney thought that this leak came from Vince Russo and, uh, called into the company to ask for Vince. When Vince got on the phone, he cussed him out saying he's going to kill him, et cetera, et cetera. And then Vince said, you realize this is Vince McMahon and ball said no and hung up. And I guess that's how in wrestling circles, he got the nickname balls. He cussed out the wrong Vince. A lot to unpack here on this very short lived Santa Claus. What the fuck was this? Well, Vince does love Santa Claus. Um, we had the real Santa Claus that would come and make parties and shit. And, uh, he made survivor series for us. Um, this year and we, we were very close to the real Santa Claus. So we thought what, you know, what if Santa had an evil twin brother and everything was the opposite. It's kind of like bizarro Santa. Yeah. You know, black, black beard. And he hated <laughs> kids instead of loved kids. What are you going to do with this guy at SummerSlam though? And he had John gi- and he had giants that like made weapons instead of midgets that made, uh, toys. How high were you when you came up with this? I don't remember. You were very but... <laughs> high. You and Briscoe were so high. Well, that was the idea. It was, it was kind of like a, just a fucking, let, let's go have some fun and shit with this. And balls got fucked up the next day and demanded money from, uh, Jim Myers, Georgie animal steel. And just, uh, yeah, I don't remember a thing about Vince Russo or anything like that. Cause Balls was pretty much fired for going off on Georgie Animal Steel about money and Jim basically telling him he would kill him because at that time, Georgie Animal Steel probably could. Um, so it was not it was not a good few days for old Santa Claus. He was he was gone back to the South Pole about as quickly as he got there. And it was a failed experiment. It was fucking rotten. I mean, it sucked. It was so fucking bad that, you know, as you're watching it, you're going, oh, fuck, man. Oh, this is not good. Um, Yeah, it's pretty rotten. But then you, you wonder if it's so rotten that it's good. But it wasn't that rotten that it was good. But I do have to differ with um, your little guy that tells lies and stuff. The greatest Santa Claus angle is an angle that I have seen portions of, but I've never seen the whole thing. But the reason it was so good is because it was told to me by the man that came up with it, the American Dream, Dusty Rhodes. And it was talking about being in Florida on Christmas Day. <laughs> in the in a cage. They got a cage match. It was like a Santa Clauses all over the building. It got about five, six, seven, eight Santa Clauses hanging out, hanging out candy in, 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 in Christmas presents, all their children all over the arena. They're all over the place. And I think it was Dusty. And Kevin Sullivan, maybe? I'm in the ring with the devil, big cage, man. This, this is a this is big blow-off and all. And I beat him with an inch of his life, and then all of a sudden, Santa Claus hits the ring. Locks the cage door. And everybody's happy, because they see Santa Claus in the ring with Mech and Dream Dusty Rose. They know that he's there, because he's only there for good. He's Santa Claus. And then Santa Claus takes this big bag full of gifts for the little children. 
and swings it over his head and knocks the American Dream out. And Santa Claus beats up the American Dream, Dusty Rhodes. And everybody's coming over the cage trying to trying to help them. Because Santa Claus and the evil Kevin Sullivan. Kevin Sullivan is so evil that he has, he has now manipulated Santa Claus to see his evil ways. The only thing pumpkin here that we didn't think of was we had five or six of the Santa Clauses in the crowd, you know, to draw attention so they couldn't pick out the one. So everybody just figures Santa Claus has turned on the American Dream way. Well, none of the rest of you Santa Claus is going to get in there and fuck up the American Dream. We're going to whip your ass. We may not be able to get to the one in the cage. And everybody started beating up any Santa Claus that was near them. Pumpkin here, we definitely had a ride. People trying to beat up any, anybody with a Santa Claus suit <laughs> on. And, and to hear Dusty fucking tell this story, and I'm just sitting there going, God damn. I've seen, you know, like different clips and shit from the Santa Claus angle, but just to hear Dusty, I go, Pumpkin here, and think about the other five or six Santa Clauses out there. <laughs> And the crowd just thought Santa Claus had done turned. And before these Santa Clauses get in there and fuck up American Dream, we got to stop them. And everybody started jumping Santa Clauses all over the building. There's one. Get him. Mrs. Claus, she's a whore. Get her too. Yeah. How did you get Vince to agree to Santa Claus? Oh, he had a hand in it. He's not completely innocent. When did he realize, oh, this, this, this was bad. The very what next night, the first time. <laughs> yeah. 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 You, 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 you visualize something, but then I'm, I'm not sure that uh, balls was the right candidate either. Except, I mean, he looked the part. He did look the part. And I guess, uh, his literally his first day at TV. Or the very next day after that is when he pops off with uh Georgie yeah. Steel. Yeah. Well that's less than yeah. ideal. Yeah, it wasn't good. It wasn't good. Do you ever hear about this? a thousand dollars or something like that? Do you ever hear this uh story where uh he accidentally cusses out the wrong vents? He's got heat with Russo, but it's actually McMahon. Uh no, I didn't. Uh I yeah, who knows that yeah, balls was drinking an awful lot then. Well, be sure to ask him tomorrow and report back to us next. Next up, Undertaker beats King Mabel in a casket match in six minutes and eleven seconds. Mabel did a bunch of moves, and Undertaker kept sitting up. Mo distracted Undertaker, allowing Mabel to use a belly to belly, a leg drop, and a big splash. And that's pretty much all we got. Uh, Mo went to put Undertaker in the casket, but forgot to shut the lid. The two celebrated, and then as I went to shut the lid, Undertaker blocks it, gets out of the casket, and of course makes his comeback. After a choke slam, Undertaker kicks Mabel into the casket. Mo then attacks Undertaker, who's not selling it, and choke slams Mo instead, throws him in the casket as well, grabs the necklace, which uh, had the remnants of the urn, to get back his magical powers and shut the lid. Uh, Meltzer would say it wasn't anywhere near as bad as their previous pay per view match. So this just goes to show you that Undertaker really can turn chicken shit into chicken salad. Gets a star and a half. Boy, somewhere in this era, he had to be like nut tapping you every time he walked past you in the hallway. You gave me Giant Gonzalez. You gave me King Kong Bundy. You gave me fucking Mabel. Can You're I You're welcome. Well, you know, well, well. It's run, it, King Mabel has sort of run his course, right? He's going to work the King nice. Mabel would definitely run his course. In, in, but you know what? God damn it. It wasn't that bad. Okay. You got to see some of the athleticism of, of Mabel, and it wasn't that fucking bad. And it was meant to be exactly what it was. And this was a, a opportunity for Undertaker to get his revenge and put Mabel and Mo and all them in a casket and be gone. He hits the 96 Royal rumble and then he's done. He's all finished up. Um, I guess he, you know, heard a lot of people along the way, diesel taker, et cetera. And as you said, the gimmick had just sort of run its course. Let's talk to the main event though. Bret Hart's going to retain 
beating Davy Boy Smith in 21 minutes and nine seconds. Uh, Meltzer really loved it. He gave it four and a half stars. This is the best match on the card, and it's not close. Uh, Bret Hart retains the title here with a Lucha Cradle. Um, Diana Smith is coming to ringside with Davy Boy. Diana was pushed hard on TV, is rooting 100% for Davy Boy in this match rather than being torn between the two as she had been at that 92 classic SummerSlam match. It started slow, but builds into a very great match. Meltzer would say among the new spots was Hart trying for a superplex, Smith blocking it and picking Hart up as a reversal and crotching him on the top rope. Hart hit his head on the steps and had his back rammed into the post and ends up juicing heavily. And I got to tell you, this really caught me off guard. Uh, when I watched this one back, I forgot all about this bloodbath. Uh, Smith used a pile driver and a headbutt off the top rope for near falls. And after a bow and arrow, Hart reverses it, goes for a sharpshooter, but of course, Davey gets out. And now they're trading near falls until Brett hits a plancha. He tries for a second dive, but Smith catches him and power slams him on the floor, which is a big time move in 95 or in 2020. Smith undoes the mats around the ring and goes to suplex Hart. But of course, Brett reverses it and crotches Smith on the guardrail. He uses a backbreaker and a superplex for near falls. And then Smith tries a rolling reverse, but Hart reverses it for another near fall. And then finally gets the win. After the match, Smith leaves hugging his wife and walking out together, which looks as if he's going to turn babyface, according to Meltzer. In the commentary in the closing minutes, they definitely gave you the impression both were babyfaces, according to Dave. Four and a half stars. It really did save the show. It's been a sort of an eh show. There are some interesting things if you look back at it. Uh, but this match, I mean, this is the definition of a one match show when it's over, right? This is what everybody's talking about. What about the hog pin and the fucking casket match? Oh God. You like those as good as this one? This was good shit. Man. I thought this was a very good match. I thought it was a great match actually. Um, and it was, you know, it was a good final match. It was absolutely excellent with two of the best, but it fucking should have been. And it was a good story with Diana and, um, you know, the family dynamic. I thought every bit of it worked out great and was a damn good story. Uh, Melzer's teasing here that, oh, it seems like they're going to turn this, you know, turn him baby face. But of course we know that didn't happen. Was it ever considered? No, I, I'm sure that <laughs> I'm sure that probably, uh, some of the hearts wanted it, wanted them all to be back as one big happy family. But at this point, no, man, I can't believe I'm about to read this to you. Cause I, it, I, I wasn't, I'll admit I wasn't paying attention uh, close enough to really know for sure. Uh, I guess I'll go review the tape again, but this just jumps off the page at me. Most reports are that the blood in the heart Smith match was from a blood capsule rather than a blade job. Don't know for sure. Bruce. What the fuck? Yeah. I'm not even going to dignify that with a response. Uh, fucking idiot. It's already announced here that the WWF champion would defend at the Royal rumble against the undertaker. So undertaker and Paul bear were doing an interview when diesel came out and complained saying he deserved the title shot and the show went off the air with a two doing a face to mask stare down. Of course, this is when, uh, undertaker still wearing that mask. How did these two wind up programmed together for WrestleMania? Did taker want to work with diesel vice versa? Did it come from Vince? Did you already know at this point diesel's given notice and he's finishing up? No, we didn't know, you know, and, and this was during the time that, that Kevin was really also talking about he wouldn't, he would never leave and so on and so forth. But beside the point, it was when you look in the book and you look at one of the best attractions for WrestleMania, uh, Diesel and Undertaker was definitely one of the best attractions. So this was planting the seeds and knowing that we were going to get there and just a little different way to do it. We started after the live pay-per-view ends. Of course, the, the, the crowd there in the arena still gets some stuff. They get gold dust versus Duke, the dumpster, Drose, Drosy. Meltzer would say the match went too long and had no heat following the main event. Uh, and then smoking guns and Hakushi are going to team with Barry Horowitz. Let me recap here. the smoking guns, Barry Horowitz and Hakushi. Bless you are going to take on Yokozuna, Isaac Yankum, Skip, and Zip. What the fuck, dude? What's wrong with that? That's weird. Woof. 
Let's send them home happy. Are you saying Dr. John Richards is not main event, last match quality? No, I just love that you got him teaming with an evil dentist, a Yokozuna, sumo wrestler, Hakushi, and he's taking on Hakushi and a couple cowboys. Yeah. Uh, the best match poll, Damn according right. to the Wrestling Observer readers, it's unanimous. Bret Hart and Davey Boy. The worst match, also not close. Ahmed Johnson and Buddy Landale. Meltzer would be pretty critical, saying it was like two different shows. Uh, it was almost a complete mess. One bad match after another, one bad segment after another, a total lack of crowd heat. It seemed like one was watching a dying company like the AWA at the end, desperately throwing bad angle and bad character that you knew wasn't going to get over Just hoping that something would stick going into the main event. The show was in the toilet and more memorable because the WWF, for whatever reason, decided against confiscating signs before the show. Either way, then came the main event with Bret Hart and Davey Boy Smith, and the match was nothing short of fantastic. It featured the return of the WWF using heavy juice by Hart. The announcer, Vince McMahon, apparently in an effort to play both sides of the coin, ordered wide shots and apologized about the blood, I guess to placate cable people who don't want blood on wrestling pay-per-views, while also trying to get over a rougher style because the old style just doesn't cut it anymore. Hart's blood caused an ECW arena like reaction of he's hardcore. The finish of the show complete with a post, a post show face off with undertaker and diesel was so good. I almost felt guilty giving the show with a main event that that strong, a thumbs down. That probably explains the mixed reaction in the show poll. Although many who voted thumbs up were very strong in that feeling, almost all citing blood as the reason. And there are a lot of ECW signs in the crowd. Like we're hardcore ECW gangsters rule. Mikey rules. Um, hello, ECW fans read the Lariat. There's lots of ECW references. So I guess, you know, as silly as you're going to say, oh, we didn't even consider that blood, the main event, boy, the crowds into it and the fans at home loved it. I thought it really added a lot to the match. Uh, I think this is an underrated pay-per-view just because of the main event. Having said all that, how do you respond to uh, Meltzer's report? And what do you think of the show? Yeah, I thought the show was solid. Uh, I think that everything considered when you you package the entire show and look at it, and I did enjoy the hog pen match, and I thought that The Undertaker and Mabel was a good match as well. Last match was great. So, you know, you have a kind of a roller coaster, and if – if you if you start off and you wear your audience out again, I think that you can't have every single match be the same. So it was different. There was variety, and I thought it was a solid show. Not good, not bad. Let's uh, let's do some questions here. We've got lots of them uh, from our listeners here. If you want to ask a question for next week, and we should remind you next week, and I'm so fucking pumped about this. It's our Christmas episode, and man, we always have fun with this. But this this time in particular, the show actually drops on Christmas Day, which is kind of cool. And we figured. Why have a Merry Christmas? I love that for a minute you weren't looking at the camera and you just looked away and you're like, did he, where'd he go? Oh, oh, that was, that was me. That was for me. <laughs> <It's my point. laughs> uh, ben wants to know, uh, there's been times when Vince was cool with blood. And then there are times like now where Vince apparently despises blood. Why do you think his feelings have changed? What do you think Vince's true feelings are on getting juice? Uh, you know, times change, your tastes change. That's just life. You evolve. Well, it's also worth mentioning, you know, he's, he's running a business. So if, if, if there is an appetite for it, or there's major pushback from it, from advertisers, I mean, you've got a right. I mean, that's like always a consideration. You, you never want to hurt your business with your creative. Well, again, it's, you know, times change, tastes change. Uh, Someone asks here, why did no one ever tell Ahmed Johnson? He always had a wedgie Were people just scared of him. God. Yes. Aren't you great question here. The post champion diesel character was awesome. This was the precursor to stone cold. Steve Austin. Was it not? 
I think Steve was different. And, and again, I, I think that, you know, Steve wasn't a giant and Nash was a big giant son of a bitch with a bad attitude. And it's just different. Mr. Beard wants to know after returning for the undertaker's farewell at survivor series, when is hog pen two going to take place? We need Henry O to get his win back. And personally, I want a hog pen pay-per-view with multiple pin matches. It turns See? out Mr. Beard and you have a lot in common. See? Damn right. Jimmy Need more hog pen. Jimmy wants to know why'd you bring back double J, but not the roadie. You know, I don't know that Brian was in a place that he was ready to come back at that point. Uh, Jordan says, uh, Vince, as well as his nameplate called one, two, three kid, just the kid during his match. Did Vince just love that? It rhymed with Sid. Why didn't it stick? You know, just the kid. Well, that was the first thing that we did call the kid was the kid. Uh, we did Kamikaze kid, a lot of different things. It's, it's like, okay, well, if you're just going to call Bret Hart Hart one time, God damn it. The fuck. Now I'm getting pissed off again, Conrad. Oh, I thought you got another call. I was already getting no. the fast forward sound effect queued up. You were ready. Weren't you? I'm ready. I'm, I'm, I know what this comes with these days. Uh, J Jaden wants to know, Bruce, where'd you find a casket big enough to hold Mabel's big old ass, big old ass caskets are us. Uh, Jordan wants to know how were the jobbers chosen to carry Mabel? Jeff Hardy has seen wincing and everyone else was looking like they were legit struggling. Well, first of all, I hate the word jobbers. It's derogatory and, um, it's, we got people that we use. It wasn't a specific, uh, goddamn casting call. Well, you, you get sideways in a hurry these days. I do. I, I, you know what? I fucking do. Was it Italian stallion who was picking the, the, the guys up or out or the question is, how are you choosing them? How are you choosing? What was the process? It was, you know, I guess when we had TV and whoever was in the area that that was there. Wasn't like, oh my God, I need that guy to wheel out the casket. Fuck. Uh, Daryl asked a good question here. He says, I remember for the next month on the TV shows that matches from this pay-per-view were shown for free, which what didn't happen beforehand. What went behind that decision? Did you think maybe because you had such a terrible buy rate that maybe if you showed them, Hey, this was entertaining shit, maybe they would reconsider or. Was it something else? I don't know. I'd have to have my memory refreshed on what matches they were and for what reason. I don't really remember that. Which bulldog Brett match do you prefer? This one or the one from SummerSlam for the IC title? Comes to us from Michael. Hmm. You got blood here, but you got a great ambiance and crowd in, in Wembley. Yeah. The purest in me would go with Wembley. Yeah. It's such a fun atmosphere. Uh, Jeremy says, who do you think was the better backstage interviewer, Todd Pettengill or doc Hendricks? Oh, hands down Todd Pettengill. Why is that? Because Todd could adapt to pretty much any situation and look like he belonged. And doc Hendricks was just, well, dip, dip, dip. Uh, Matt writes, Eric mentioned on a podcast that in 1995, Vince would write and call Ted Turner complaining about blood on WCW. And then here he is doing it. Do you remember Eric writing or calling after this blood incident here? I have no idea. Uh, Eric wants to know, Oh, I can't believe. Why didn't he just thing. call me and ask me then? Eric wants to know how would Jerry Jarrett describe the hog pen match? Uh, fuck him. I can't even do disgust me. I can't even do him. All right. Last one. Joe Lawson wants to know the number one, six, two, four on the house. 1624 is the house number. Is there an Easter egg behind that? God damn. Y'all dig deep. That's uh, a good one no, though. They're, they're not to my knowledge. Okay. Maybe the guy, maybe the, the set designer did that, but I have no idea. 1624. I could see, uh, two, four, seven, one, six, two, four. That's going to bug the fuck out of me. Now. I doubt it. 
Well, let's find out. Uh, you're going to ask Vince tomorrow about, uh, Santa yeah, Claus right calling in, in the 1624 yeah. figure that out and then work on SmackDown. Don't forget to watch SmackDown later tonight, live on Fox. And you guys have a big pay-per-view coming up this weekend too, right? Bruce. I got TLC on WWE network, only nine 99. Check it out. And uh, we'll be back next week. Just in time for Christmas. Hit it, Bruce. I have a Merry Christmas when you can have a (laughs) next week on something to wrestle with Bruce Pritchard rock on. Hey, we made it to the end without another phone call. Can you believe it? Oh, wait, shit. I got to go. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30-year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.